Hi, y'all, and welcome to tonight's live stream. Another night when I could not wait to hit go live because I'm dying to talk to y'all about this. This is so important and so interesting. Becky Hill, the elected clerk of Colleton County, South Carolina, pulled off an amazing feat. She put together a trial, dealt with one of the largest events I can even imagine planning, and dealt with it smoothly. Press was happy. TV was happy. Court people, personnel were happy. And now a clerk of court has managed to become the most divisive figure of the trial after Alec Murdoch himself. She wrote a book after the trial. And the question we're going to talk about tonight is whether she has helped the Murdoch team with this book. Now, happy Wednesday, everybody. It's been a really busy week for the court system. Courts typically kind of start up again about this time. They start up and start talking about when everybody gets back from vacations over the summer and they start holding hearings and things. So that's why there's a lot of busyness in the courts going on right now. Now, I did something that y'all have been joking with me about. Maybe no one else in the country did. I don't know. I did. I read this entire book cover to cover. This is the book Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders, written by Becky Hill with Neil Gordon. So I read it 100%, every word. I read it, the foreword, I read the acknowledgments, I read the about the author, I read everything so that I could talk to you about it. So maybe I'm the only person who read it, I don't know, but all the more reason for you to be here and let's talk about what I found out because I wanna look at three things tonight. I wanna, these are three things that I think the Murdoch team is arguing or will argue, and I want your opinion on what you think about these based on the quotes from the book. So the first topic I want to talk about is, in her book, in her own words, has Becky Hill handed the Murdoch team ammunition for arguing that she was biased against the Murdochs? That will particularly be important if, in fact, Alec Murdoch wins a new trial. The question will be, who will conduct it? Where will it be? And so is there support for that in the book? The second thing I want to talk about, second topic is in her book, in her own words, has Becky Hill handed the Murdoch team ammunition for arguing that she gave away inside confidential information? And the third thing I want to talk about is in her book, in her own words again, has Becky Hill handed the Murdoch team ammunition for their argument that she tampered with the jury by communicating with the jury? So that's what we're going to look at. What does the book say about these three topics? The topic of was she biased? Did she give away inside information? And did she communicate with jurors? Has she given them any ammunition? So we're going big picture here. Um, this is not a critique of the book. Um, others have critiqued the book. I'll give you a quick little, this is Dick Harputlian's statement. Of that truly sound like somebody Hard to hear the question. You'll hear him in a minute. Well, she's trying to make a lot of money. That's the point. I mean, she did. She's trying to make money off of it. She's selling the book. I mean, the question is, was it a successful scheme? <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, what if you've read it? I'm not going to give a book review here, but I don't know that you buy the book. I mean, it's not well written. The story they t she tells is not accurate, um, in in our opinion, at least the the, the facts as we saw them. So, so as with Dick Carpootlian, I'm not trying to critique the book. I mean, was she, uh, is she Charles Dickens or maybe Pat Conroy or J.K. Rowling or John Grisham? You know, no, but then who among us is, right? So, but I found it interesting. I found it easy to read. So, but I'm not looking tonight at the book itself or, or the way it's written. I'm looking at the content. I'm looking at how this is going to impact the ability of the Murdoch team to make their arguments. So that's what we're going to look at tonight. Now, for sure, I'm not looking at the, I'm looking at the content of her book and you want to know more about, the, you want more content about the cases that everybody's talking about. So be sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you would hit the like button for the video, it'll help it get out to more people. So question number one, has Becky Hill handed the Murdoch team 
ammunition for arguing that she was biased against them. I feel sure we will hear about that, not only from the Murdochs, um, but in terms of whether the, Alec Murdoch gets a new trial, but also in terms of whether or not, if he gets a new trial, who will conduct it and where it will be conducted. And I wanna start with a question. Does the clerk actually have to be unbiased? Is that even important for the clerk? I wanted to know, my way of thinking of that um, is absolutely 100% the clerk must be unbiased, but I wanted to know if that was state specific, maybe up in other states, maybe specifically in South Carolina, it's different. I don't think so, uh, based on Eric Bland's comments related to this, but I didn't find a specific rule about it in South Carolina. I would defer to somebody who practices there. I So instead, I look for this. What are some model rules, some guidelines for court personnel? Were there any? And let me show you something that I found. I'll share this, my screen with you. Oh, I am going to go over here to the code of conduct. The model, this is the model code of conduct for court professionals. And it is put out by the National Association for Court Management. And let me tell you um, who they say it's for. I'll flip on down here. They say it is intended to apply to all court professionals who work for the courts. It includes full-time, part-time, and temporary employees. Now, let me be clear on this. This is not a law. This is not even a binding document that Becky Hill or anyone has to comply with. No one is going to be removed from office because they don't comply with this or go to jail for violating it. it I was not able to find something this specific in South Carolina. So why are we looking at it? We're looking at it to get a general idea of what other court officials think would be the standard. What do other court officials think court officials should do? How should they behave? And so that's what we're getting from this is just this will help us understand what other court officials think about the way courts of clerk, clerks of court or other court officials ought to behave. So um, let's take a look a little bit more into what the document says. I'm going to look at just three things real quickly. 1.2, a court professional avoids both impropriety and the appearance of impropriety. Impropriety would be doing something that's not appropriate, something that would be, if not, it's a little less than wrong. It's just not really appropriate. And you'll see they write that down here. Avoiding impropriety is a standard higher than simply obeying the law. It's not just that you did what you were supposed to, you, you obeyed the law, you didn't break the law. It's something more than that. You avoided something that could have been perceived as bad, avoided the, well, that would be more, avoided the appearance of impropriety is the standard even higher than that. So you're avoiding anybody even thinking that you did something inappropriate or that wasn't right. And they're saying, that's what we want for court officials. 1.3 says, the court professional makes the court accessible and conducts his or her work without bias or prejudice. And then I'll, I'll skip a few. The, they are relevant maybe to some of the arguments that Dick Harputlian made at the press conference, but I want to, for tonight's purposes, just talk about these. 2.7, a court professional respects the personal lives of litigants, the public, applicants, and employees, disregards information that legally cannot or should not otherwise be considered, uses good judgment in weighing the credibility of internet information, is cautious about verifying identities and uses the internet wisely. So those are the general topics I wanna, uh, that I wanna talk about in terms of what the National Association for Court Management said. These are things that we th think are important for court officials. So in general, most people would say that is important for a court official. Is it a law? Is it binding? No, let me make that super clear. But these, this gives us a general framework for evaluating what she said and for considering, is it even important that she be unbiased? In my view, it, from my experience, it would be, but I wanted to know what do other people think in general, whether or not it's specific to South Carolina, I'm not gonna be able to tell you. But let's go ahead and take a look then at some quotes from the book. So these quotes are, 
taken all from Becky Hill's book, Behind the Doors of Justice, The Murdoch Murders. Um, the first category I want to talk about is bias and whether or not Becky Hill has handed some ammunition to the Murdoch team for arguing that she was biased against them. This might have tried, and I mean it in two directions. One is, was she biased at the first trial? And then the second is, would she be biased in the case of a new trial? Now, this is general. This is not cited in the motion for new trial. And in fact, I'll take you real quickly to the motion for new trial, which had three grounds. The clerk of court tampered with the jury by advising them not to believe Murdoch's testimony and other evidence presented by the defense that the clerk of court pressured them to reach a quick guilty verdict and even misrepresenting critical and material information to the trial judge in her campaign to remove a juror she believed to be favorable to the defense. So that was what they argued in terms of why they ought to get a motion for a new trial. So let's head back over to the quotes because what I'm talking about here is more general. If in fact a clerk of court should be unbiased, should not be in favor of any one litigant or one party, has she handed them ammunition to say, you, Becky Hill, are in fact biased against us. Let's take a look. The first thing I want to talk about is something that I've seen in some comments on Twitter and some other places about Becky Hill saying she had some personal relationship with Alec Murdoch and that that may have colored what she thought of him or the way she treated him. I personally, uh, well, I'll read it to you. This is a quote from the book. I was very concerned, even conflicted by professional relationships I had developed with the defendant, Alec Murdoch, and the Murdoch law firm, including Alec's brother, Randy. I had come to know the Murdochs and the members of the firm as I served in my capacity as official court reporter. Now, there she talks about a professional relationship, not a personal one, a professional one. I think that the confusion about the personal came from this comment that she made in the Fox Nation. Let me add this. The one that read the verdict of Alec Murdoch. And it was a little, um, my breath was knocked out for a moment, but then I have to tell myself that to treat this just like any other trial, any other verdict that I have to read, and I have to place my mind there and take out any other personal um, relationships. So I, I think, that when she talked about that personal relationship, I think she just misspoke. I really think she was referring to a professional relationship. I've seen nothing that suggested that she had some longstanding relationship. And in fact, she talks about in her book about the moment she met Randolph Murdoch, Murdoch, Alex's father and Alex. So I don't think that, you know, they had dated in high school or some kind of connection like that. I don't think that was the case. So let's add this back in. So, but was she biased against them for some reason other than a longstanding personal relationship? Was she biased? And I want to start with her comments about the defense, the defense team, and specifically Jim Griffin. She had some very harsh statements for him. She said, what shocked me while listening to the podcast, this would be his podcast, was how disrespectful Jim seemed toward the clerk of Kurt's court's office, that's her office, and Judge Newman. She also said, and these, this is really strong language, Jim must have felt a bit neutered by some strategic disagreements that were rumored to be going on with his lead counsel, Dick Carputlian, and some disagreements with a third attorney, Maggie Fox. The tension was palpable. Those, I mean, that's close to fighting words in many places. I mean, that's very strong language she used about Jim Griffin. She called his closing argument robotic and she quoted an IT professional that the defense counsel had hired, but that apparently they had quite the dispute with during trial as saying Jim Griffin was rattled the whole time. So those are comments she made about Jim Griffin and his conduct during the trial and about him. Here's something she said about Dick Carputlian. She mentioned he was plain hurt, having been ill. He looked distracted, irritable, bloated and was accused of falling asleep or yawning excessively. That's a quote from her book. Of utmost concern are some comments she made about Alec Murdoch's guilt. And I want to go into that because here is where I think they will have their strongest argument that she handed them some reason to believe she is biased against Alec Murdoch. 
Here's what she said in her book. She said, although I was conflicted about knowing the Murdoch family and about having so many people watching and listening to me as I read the verdict, I was mostly concerned about Alec being found innocent when I knew in my heart he was guilty. I had this fear that the goodwill the Murdochs had built up in the community would influence the jury. So clearly, at least by that time, she believed that he was guilty and wanted that to be the verdict. During cross-examination, he, Alec Murdoch, appeared to be stalling. It became irritating to me. I believe he was lying and changing his story on the fly. So she made that comment that he was lying on the stand. Alec was an actor on the stand, just as he was in all areas of his life, but on the stand, he was classic in the way he said too much. So she's called him an actor and a liar and wanted the jury to find him guilty. That's what we conclude so far. There was a sober, quiet cheer from almost everyone I spoke with about the guilty verdict. And I left out a little here, good versus evil, and they want good to prevail. So she went, this is pretty strong language again, equating, in my view, Alec Murdoch with evil and good as being on the opposite side or him being convicted. And so, the, and she's saying that most people felt that way. She also said there was no danger. Um, and let me give a little background on this. You may remember that one of the issues at trial that was raised by the Murdoch team was the argument that there were the day after, like within hours of the time of the Murdochs, uh, of the murders of Maggie and Paul Murdoch, there was a statement from SLED saying there's no danger to the public. I believe it came from Collison County and SLED together jointly. And there was an argument about that. The prosecution and prosecution witnesses said, oh, that doesn't show any bias or that we had already decided it was Alec Murdoch. And that they even had the person from Colleton County come and talk about why that was put out and it was all a mistake. And the defense team argued, well, in fact, the reason that this got put out was because they were already convinced that Alec Murdoch had murdered Maggie and Paul, his wife and his son. And so once they concluded that, they didn't care what, they didn't even bother to look. So at that point, they'd made up their minds. Ironically, that's what she says too in her book. She says, from my perspective, it can only mean one thing, that all the evidence was pointing to Alec as a murderer. I thought that was ironic. Then she also talked about how her belief in Alec's guilt was formed earlier. She talked about when the indictments came out on July 14, 2022, which is nearly a year before the verdict came out or months, many months before the verdict came out. This is just the indictment where he's going to be charged. He's going to be tried. So she said, my intuition had been right. She already had the intuition about something that was so terribly wrong and I was crushed. So she already believed she had immediate intuition that Alec had done these murders and then the indictments came out and she believed her intuition was confirmed and she was crushed. She even put some statements in there about what intuition is. She also made statements in her book that she voted her opinion about Alec Murdoch's guilt or innocence twice before the verdict was ever delivered. First, at report, with reporters at a party, there was a birthday party for one of the reporters and also for Becky Hill herself, who had a birthday at around the same time. She said it was fueled by a little truth serum in the form of liquid refreshments. And she said, I can't tell you how everyone voted or how anyone voted. She says that in her book. But many of the party guests agreed with what ended up becoming the actual verdict of the trial. The implication of that to me is that she voted at this earlier stage sometime prior to the actual final verdict of the jury that she voted that she thought he was guilty there's also this one on the way back from the jury visit to moselle the home where maggie and paul were murdered she was not with the jury let me make that clear she was not in the same van with the jury but she said that the group voted just as the jury would do in a span of three hours. Three hours is how long it took them to do their deliberations. 
we in the van unanimously came to our own verdict injury. I think I meant inquiry. Um, oh, in just, I wonder why did I say injury? We came to our own verdict in just three minutes and that was guilty. So she's saying that she and the group came collectively to the belief that he was guilty and voted that way on the way back to the courthouse. She also gave opinions about Alec Murdoch. She gave opinions about him personally, and let's take a look at them. I believe Alec is a classic narcissist. He has lofty thoughts about himself. I feel like he has convinced himself he was innocent and that he cleaned up the murder scene so well that he would not get caught. I think he thought he had the lies and the alibis wrapped up tight. She also said about Alec Murdoch, many of us question if Alec is bipolar, schizophrenic, or a narcissist, while some wonder if he snapped due to financial pressure, Paul's boating accident, and the crumbling of the family dynasty. These are very harsh opinions. She called him a narcissist, I said he had lofty thoughts about himself, and thought he had the lies and the alibis wrapped up tight. Those are very specific about her belief about whether he was telling the truth. She, and then these throwing in these other things, bipolar, schizophrenic, narcissist, she throws all of those in as well. She also said she went back and after, I believe this was after the trial, looked at video, watched video of Alec on the stand. And she said, I saw a lot of mucus coming from Alec's nose but he didn't have a lot of tears coming out of his eyes. It was another example of his insincerity and his lies. So very specific opinions about Alec Murdoch, about whether he was telling the truth. So, and I want to get into what she said about the Murdochs, because this is very interesting and very telling. Now I want to show you some contradictions, some conflicts in what's said about them. And I ask you, you know, your thoughts on this. Minutes before the bomb threat, Lynn Murdoch, and I don't know how to pronounce her last name, um, we'll just call her Lynn Murdoch, handed the, uh, do you remember the whole incident where Alec Murdoch was, tried to take, handed a book by his sister, which he tried to take back into the courthouse, and the entire family was banished, having supposedly done numerous things throughout trial. I never saw a video of that, I don't doubt it. Um, collecting those, but they were moved to the back of the courthouse, the back of the courtroom, I should say. They had been up front where they could see better. They got moved to the back for not behaving appropriately in the courtroom. And one of the reasons was this book. And the sister Lynn handed, apparently, according to what's described here, handed the book to the defense counsel paralegal right as or right before the bomb threat. The paralegal, they're pulling everything together quickly. She puts the book in Alec Murdoch's box of materials and he takes it back to the jail with him. It didn't sound like really egregious behavior. It didn't sound like Lynn had handed the book to Alec. Instead, she had handed it to the paralegal who tossed it in the box. So I just thought that was interesting information. So here's what she said about the Murdochs. Their legacy of controlling the justice system as solicitors, attorneys, and as a prominent wealthy family, I've got some misspellings here, I was typing quickly, had come with alleged misuse of power, yet there was a lot of love and loyalty for them. I always knew the Murdoch family could be characters, and like others, I had heard rumors of hidden bodies and untimely deaths and fixed juries. She said, obviously there are stories about the long line of Murdochs and their actions, indiscretions, and family secrets. It's obvious they've done some things not to be proud of, but they admit to very little, if anything at all. And I wonder, what are those things? What are those things they're not proud of? I, it sounds very interesting, actually, very intriguing. Definitely the subject of a future novel. In more recent years, the talk around town was that much was done for Alec, Paul, and Buster in cleaning up their messes. In these parts of the low country, many of us referred to the Murdochs as the Kennedys of South Carolina, a family that would protect its brand at any cost during indiscretions, power plays, and legal wrangling. As mentioned earlier, privilege was at the forefront during the trial. For example, the Murdoch family made special requests for a private family room, a private bathroom, and preferred seating in the courtroom during the trial. So, 
that I thought was maybe a little unfair because it appeared that Lynn Murdoch herself is a victim advocate. That's her job. She re representing victims. So she would be used to this exact sort of thing, what you asked for at the courthouse. So I assume that that's why they requested that. There's no question that Maggie and Paul Murdoch were true crime victims, even though their reputations in our community were questionable. I went, whoa, wait a minute. I can see where maybe Paul Murdoch's reputation might have been questionable after the boat wreck. And there was a lot of talk about his drinking heavily. But I never heard anything about Maggie having a bad reputation in the community. So that was of interest to me. I wanted to know what exactly she meant on that. Um, and she talked about meeting the father, Mr. Randolph Murdoch and Alec, met them apparently at the same time. And she described it. She said, they asked me about myself, who I was married to, my children, my parents, where I came from, and made me feel like a friend from the beginning. They just had an easy way about them that made anyone feel like they were the most important person in the room. And the next time they saw me, they remembered specific details but I quickly learned that I wasn't the only one they did this to. This was a way of life for them. They had passed down this wonderful charm from generation to generation. It was the Southern way, the Murdoch way. They all knew how to work a crowd and leverage relationships to develop influence. I'm gonna shorten that. So that led me to this question. Okay, it, who are the Murdochs? Let's go back to all this stuff about um, the controlling the justice system, mis alleged misuse of power, rumors of hidden bodies and untimely deaths, and done obvious they've done some things not to be proud of, but they admit to very little. Okay, who did that? That's what I wanted to know. Who are these Murdochs? And when you look at what she says about the individual members of the family, it wasn't clear to me. About Randolph, she said, he was so good to me. He was always very kind, welcoming, asking me about my family. I always look forward to being in his company. This is Mr. Randolph, the father. Mr. Randolph was a legend and you put Mr. in front of his name out of respect. So I assume it was not Mr. Randolph Murdoch. He was revered and respected by everyone. Now, Randy Murdoch, the brother, defense, she figured the defense didn't call him and the reason was they were concerned he could have broken the brotherly bond. He could have been a better witness for the prosecution than the defense. She And she called him similarly respectful and with a beautiful family. John Marvin, the other brother of Alec, he baits birthday cakes for his children every year since they've been born. And he shook his head in agreement with everything Judge Newman said as he sentenced Alec. Lynn, Lynn Marvin, she was the main reason the family was moved to that back pew. She's the only one left, right? She's the only one left it could be. Her eyes were cold and her countenance hard as she listened intently to Judge Newman address her brother. She even rolled her eyes when Judge Newman announced that Alex's life sentences would run consecutively. I didn't see any sympathy of or concern or compassion for her brother, but I learned later that she and her husband are both compassionate people. So I, I still was left somewhat confused. Other than Alec Murdoch and maybe Paul, who's left? Uh, she even said some nice things about Buster. So I don't know who exactly all of these people who did the terrible things were, but it appears that it wasn't any of the people that we know. So I don't know. Are there other family members? Maybe. I want to compare this to the way she talked about, for example, Mark Tinsley. She called him handsome, bearded, and gruff, a gentleman, kind, and a dream for a court reporter like me because he provided information, became a friend, recently married a special lady, and they're a beautiful couple. Then compare that to Tony Satterfield and the way she talked about Tony Satterfield. He was one of the victims of Alec Murdoch's admitted financial crimes. He was the son of Alec Murdoch's housekeeper. And she said she admitted it is likely my staff and I and Judge Newman will be seeing Tony Satterfield again with a pending trial against Alec Murdoch. So she's saying Tony Satterfield and Alec Murdoch are going to be squared off against each other in this very courtroom in, with me, with me as the, court, the clerk of court and with Judge Newman. And here's what she said about Tony Satterfield. Now, you heard what she said about Alec Murdoch, that he was a liar and all those things we went through. 
Here's what she said about Tony Satterfield. Incredibly bright, sweet, and simple. A wise young man. And it goes back to good versus evil. People will naturally empathize with the Satterfields who lost their mom and were cheated out of insurance money. Okay, so now I want your opinion. We've talked about the issue of bias, which I believe Alec Murdoch's team is going to say they think Becky Murdoch if you remember, Becky Hill was biased against them and that she either did treat them unfairly in the first trial in the way, well, they do say that in the way she talked to the jury or she would treat them unfairly in the future at a new trial. So I would like to know your, your thoughts. Do you think they have an argument here? Do you think that they have some legitimate grounds for that? Has she handed them something to argue that in her book? Does her book give them some ammunition? So let's talk now about the second topic. The second topic I want to ask about was, has she given away inside knowledge? Are they going to be able to argue that her book gives away inside knowledge that she shouldn't have given? Again, this is general. This is not cited in the motion for new trial. I do believe they will argue this when it comes time, maybe at that, that motion, but definitely when it relates to any possibility of the new trial. Here's what she said about the jurors. Um, and she talked about one juror in particular. She said some specific things about the jurors who served. She said, while most of the jurors were focused and engaged during the Murdoch trial, we did have one juror who was an alternate at one point who was not. She was more focused on the crowd. For example, she caught a new visitor to the courtroom who was sitting directly across from her who looked like she may have been taking a picture of the jury and that wasn't going to fly with her. So she, the way I read this, the way it's kind of written in my mind is she's saying this juror was focused on all the wrong things like this irrational belief that this person sitting there, a new visitor to the courtroom was trying to take a picture of the jury. And that's, you know, she was all up in arms about someone taking a picture of the jury. Contrasted with this, later in the book she says, it was the day before Alec Murdoch was convicted and I was concerned that someone was trying to use their cell phone to take photos or videos of the jury members while they were inside the government issued vans. Taking photos or video of the jury is a huge violation. She also talked about another juror who couldn't or wouldn't sit still during the trial and it seemed like every time she shifted her chair it made a loud squeak. Occasionally attorneys would await or would wait for the rhythm of the squeaks to subside before continuing their cross-examination. So those are things she said about the jurors. I'm not going to get into the Ed lady. We talked about that some before, and it's such a big thing. It would take too long, I think, to get into that. So the defense. Now, let's talk about, did she, and this, did she reveal information about Alec Murdoch or the defense that was inappropriate. Will they, has she handed them anything they can argue at all in respect to that? Word is from someone on the defense team that Alec had been practicing and perfecting his snot and crying display for weeks. That is very serious because it would suggest that one of, someone on his team, someone actually paid to represent Alec Murdoch as part of his team stated that he was fake crying, stated to other people that he'd been working on this, practicing it for weeks. That would be very serious. I, how would she know that? I'm shocked that someone would say such a thing. If someone who on his team would say that. She did say this about Buster. I was troubled by how unaffected Buster appeared. He was emotionless. This is during the sentencing she was talking about. He seemed almost irritated to be there. I learned later that he broke down uncontrollably in the Murdoch's private room in the courthouse after Alec was taken away. Now, how did she know that? I have no idea, but or where she would have learned that or who would have said such a thing, because you would assume the only people there would be people from the Murdoch family. So I don't know who would have said that. Um, they, she also talked about tours that are being given, tours that are being given at the courthouse for people who want to go and see where Alec Murdoch was tried and convicted. They give a tour. The tour was designed to mirror the steps Alec Murdoch took each morning before court began. Most people usually want to sit down and take it all in. 
this is in the room where he was held, realizing that Alec had been there every day eating his lunch and while on breaks. Many take photos of his small concrete cell, which has a toilet out in the open. The bailiffs also allow tour groups to experience what Alec did by shutting the heavy metal door behind them, creating a loud click so they know they are locked in. So that struck me in particular because I, it just strikes me wrong that there's a tour given of a man who was convicted. It just doesn't seem right. It just seems a little flippant and a little sensationalistic as opposed to something very serious, a man being tried for murder and the case is still on appeal and may come back either because it's reversed on appeal or because they win their motion for a new trial. This case may get tried again. So giving these tours to me seems inappropriate, but I'd like your opinion now. So the topic, the second topic was inside knowledge. Has she handed, does any of this that we just talked about, does that give the Murdoch team any argument that inside knowledge was passed? You decide, you tell me what you think. And then the third category is communication during trial. Now this, unlike the other two, which are more general, this is the actual topic of the motion for new trial. There is not a lot, I didn't think, that specifically related to that. I'm going to give you what I saw in the book that seemed related directly to the topic of the motion for new trial. She said, many times our jury bailiff, Bill Polk, is tasked with the duty of monitoring the jury's conversations to ensure that no conversations are held that could bias any juror before all the evidence is complete. But Bailiff Polt didn't have any problems with this jury concerning that issue. They listened the first time to Judge Newman's rules and they took their oath seriously. Now that's actually ironic in that of the affidavits, several of them said that the jury talked about the case prior to the time that they went back for deliberation. So, Judge Newman told them not to do that, told them do not discuss the case with each other, with anyone outside, don't talk about it until deliberations start. Then you're free to talk about it, but don't do it until then. So it, from this, I think would be good. So I'll go ahead and say, rather than just your opinion, I'll also give mine on this one. I think this is an argument in her favor on this. She mentioned too, one of the things that the jurors talked about, several people commented on, was that they believed Becky Hill, the clerk of court, was talking to the juror foreman during the jury's tour of Moselle, the place where Maggie and Paul were both murdered. And this slightly contradicts it. She talks about the eerie silence. Moselle visit was very silent in her book. She also, but I thought this was cited in the motion for new trial. Obviously, Alec Murdoch's team agrees that this is extremely serious. Here's what she said. While the jurors viewed the Moselle property, we could hear and see that Alec's story was impossible. God gives us all gifts and the gift of discernment is shared by many. Some of us, either from the courthouse, law enforcement, or jury at Moselle had an epiphany and shared our thoughts with our eyes. At that moment, many of us standing there knew. I knew and they knew that Alec was guilty. And she specifically says that the jury was included and that she shared her thoughts with jury, with the jury, with our eyes. I mean, it's a little, a little broader than that. Some of us, either from the courthouse law enforcement or jury at Moselle had an epiphany and shared our thoughts with our eyes. So she included the jury in that. That is extremely important on the Alec Murdoch side. So uh, I want your opinion on that too. What's your vote there? What do you think about that? Has she given them ammunition or does she get ammunition against the Alec Murdoch motion for new trial on that? Let me pull this out. So my goal here is just to share these key quotes from you so you can understand what the book is about and how it may affect, how it may play out with the motion for new trial, whether she's helped them, whether she's helped herself in the motion for new trial that they want to file, that they have requested in the appellate court to be allowed to file. So without question, one of the biggest issues, I think, and I'll go ahead and play this little clip for you from, this is from, um, I'll stop it for just a second. This is a clip 
uh, from Court TV's interview related to what local attorneys thought about the allegations for the motion for new trial. And I thought this was relevant. I would have preferred that she would have waited until the appeal was over. You never know with these cases, obviously the 404 B uh, character evidence was a hot, hotly contested issue, which is going to be up on appeal. And there is a possibility that it could be reversed. And so I. So, and I think that probably is one of the most serious issues about it is the question about whether or not the case comes back to that very courthouse. And even if there was no improper conduct before, would they now have reason to believe that she could not be fair to them, that she was biased against them? So I want to say thanks to our moderators, Marlon and Mama Pinks. Let me know what you want to hear the most. We've got so much stuff going on. It's hard to sort of sort it through. The Koberger hearing, the Ruby Frank eight passengers case, Lori Vallow Daybell appeal coming up quickly, and she's already filed her notice of the topic she's going to be appealing on. And the state's response is coming very soon on this very issue in the Murdoch case. So give me your thoughts. What do you want to talk about the most? What do you want to talk about next? Now, be sure to hit the subscribe button because you don't want to miss any of these videos. We go live Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. And please also hit the like button on your way out. Thanks for watching, and I will see you on Friday at 7.